Well, hello YouTubers and welcome back to the Holtz Mitchell channel. And I'm sitting here in my dirty glory. Just got done rebuilding a dust collector. And uh, I realize it's a reoccurring theme, unfortunately, in wood processing in outfits that, you know, process wood and wood products. Uh, these things are kind of ubiquitous. And they're a machine that is usually ignored until they start acting up. Well, this one, here's a short gander of what it sounded and looked like before the overhaul. So as you can hear, uh, it didn't sound too healthy. That thing has been growling for a long time. Uh, the impeller had a major imbalance in it, and so it was time to take the thing out, put new bearings in it, uh, put new bearings in the motor, new belts, and uh, balance the impeller, and then put in a new volute. We didn't see the new, you know, the uh, the holes in the volute until started tearing it down. So. Here's what the thing looked like uh, during the teardown. I mean, we just pulled the whole thing out and decided just to overhaul it and give it a complete work over. So here's the volute. As you can see, you can just about stick your head through, th through some of the holes in the thing. <clears throat> so, uh, we had to tear the thing completely down and make a new volute. Now, the interesting thing about these volutes is they closely resemble a Fibonacci spiral. Um, here's a picture here of one. As you can see, it kind of looks like a, you know, the uh, spiral of a snail shell or something like that. And they're not very, you know, they're not dissimilar. They're, they're actually quite close. Whether or not mathematically they follow the same path, you know, the volute and the Fibonacci spiral remains to be seen. But nevertheless, they are on a similar path. And so we're going to go through today or in this video series, I'm going to break it up into two videos. And um, we're going to make a new volute. Um, actually, we had it rolled. I was going to make it myself, but the material was just a little bit too thick to do by hand. So we sent it out to have it rolled. And, um, but nevertheless, you get to see some of the assembly of it. And then um, later on, some of the other uh, intricacies of, of rebuilding one of these things. Oops. Power went off on the thing here. All right, we'll set him aside. Let's see. Yeah, I got a glare on my on my video screen there, or on the uh, viewfinder, so I had to 
stop and check because this thing just started acting up and I thought well I better check the camera too and make sure it's all right. Anyway, uh, back to the subject at hand. Now, um, one of the things you're going to encounter when you're doing, dealing with these, um, these dust collectors is the inordinate amount of rust. And this thing had corrosion problems left, right, and center. Um, all the screws, here's a picture of some of the screws. As you can see, they're just totally ate up. Um, and the motor mount rails, they were, you know, they had problems as well. If you placed them on a flat surface, they would actually teeter-totter back and forth and, you know, rock back and forth. And so there was no getting them mounted back onto the base plate without, you know, putting some kind of strain on them, you know, the cast iron. So anyway, we're going to jump into making these um, mounting rails. Um, conform to, you know, make them, make them square, flat, and flush again. And the other thing that we're going to do to them is in the center, we're going to make the grooves as such to where it will accept an M12 screw head, uh, bolt head. Um, so that would be a 19 millimeter, roughly a three quarter inch um, bolt head in the slot instead of having to make special T-bolts. So here's how we're going to do that. Now, as you can see, um, there's hardly any reference surfaces on there. And in order to get um, a reference surface on there, we just kind of went through, um, you know, mounted things up on the on the uh, on the mill table, ran it back and forth to see whether or not one end and the other end was, you know, relatively within plus or minus a half a millimeter of one another, you know, a couple tenths. As it turned out, it was like negligible, less than a tenth or two. Um, and so we wound up squaring that up. And then on the front of the thing, um, making a reference surface the, so that we have something to measure off of. Um, when these things were mounted up on the base uh, of the machine, uh, nothing square, nothing plumb. It was just cattywampus. The belts, you know, didn't have proper alignment. There's just problems out the yin yang. So here's how we do that.
can see, now we got the um, mounting rails all squared up, flushed up, flattened down. There's some divots in there, like right here. So now we got the uh, mounting bars all squared up and flushed and trimmed and looking good. I get a paint job and out the door they go. So the next step, of course, is going to be, um, you know, a, a lot of stuff I'm not going to put on camera because it's just so mundane. You know, you can watch this stuff all day long on YouTube. Uh, was to wire brush the, you know, the, the housing, uh, the, the components, the base, the whole nine yards in order to um, get everything ready for, for painting. Now, the destructive part of it comes now where we're going to cut the volute out and we're going to save the, the, the front and back plates of the volute um, just because we can. They're, you know, they're serviceable. They're, they're not optimal, but they're serviceable. And, you know, we're going to try and shave off a few days off the, uh, off the build here. So, here's the volute laying on the ground. All right, so we're going to get right into the uh, into the uh, welding part of it. You know, putting the volute on on the front and back plate. And I started off with the smallest radius because that way, if the uh, the guy that rolled it didn't you know rolled it a little bit too tight, you can always pull it out. So anyway, here's some of the setups that um, we're going on to pull to push and get the volute to line up with the old uh, cover, with the front cover. Now you do the face, you know, the open side, the intake side first. And the reason being for that, um, when you're, because when you're welding, you're going to have to stick your head in there. And when you're using a MIG or, or TIG welder, um, you're going to be displacing the oxygen inside there, and so you run the risk of not so necessarily asphyxiation, but you're going to run into problems with, with your breathing. But anyway, you, so you do the uh, intake side first and get it all squared up. And then that way you can, um, you know, pull the volute whichever way you need to. Um, so anyway, here's some of the setups. Now you can see that you know some of them are you know pushing and some of them are pulling and then pulling down on top of it and so there was no real danger of the thing kind of trying to flare out like a like a funnel um, this is four millimeter um, material so it was you know it's fairly thick and so it it doesn't really want to flare and so that really wasn't an issue even if it had been by the time that uh, the back plate was being put on, would have negated it anyway. So anyway, um, here's the back plate going on.
Now, to the welds themselves, I'm using a rod that, um, quite frankly, I, I don't really like it. It's from Ehrlichon. It's called uh, Overcord. And you have to maintain a fairly tight arc with it. Um, it's, it's a really tough rod to work with. Um, by the time I got getting close to done with, the, with vel welding the volute, I was getting back into the groove where I was, you know, um, not getting so much uh, slag inclusion, but here's, you know, like picture of slag inclusion. Now, when you're welding this stuff and you think you, you know, you're doing okay. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that um, when the slag cools off, you'll get, you'll see a line and that's slag inclusion. Um, you know, in the, you know, an orange line or a dot. Um, when it cools off, when, when it um, sets up, and the slag is, is uniform in its, in its color as it cools off. Then you have a good weld underneath. And the other thing that's about this rod, um, the slag sticks to it, to the weld, like nobody's business. It's incredibly tough to chip off, even if you get the, the amperage just right. Now, the one thing that I did do on this, um, the amperage was uh, set at 95 amps. Um, 85 is the max on this uh, setting, but I was doing a lot of, of um, you know, vertical uh, falling welds, and um, so you got to bump the, the amperage up a little bit and uh, really keep a tight arc. But you got to do it on the flat as well, so you know, six one way, half a dozen the other. Now the other um, property of this rod, it's a, a 6012 equivalent. Um, I'd rather had 6013 or even better yet some 7018, but you know, got to use what's here in the shop, so um, no time to get picky. But um, this uh, this rod, the overcord is designed to be able to deal with um, dirt a little better and corrosion. Um, there's going to be some micro contamination in the steel itself, and so you're going to have a lot of, you know, microscopic wood still embedded in the in the surface of the steel. You can grind it to your heart's content until there's almost no steel left, but still you're going to have some, you know, cross contamination. So this rod is uh, pretty good about pretty forgiving actually uh, for doing that. Now ESAB has a better rod in a 6013. Um, I'll look it up and put the you know uh, thing down below here in the screen uh, what the number of that is. I like working with it. It's a very forgiving rod. Uh, you don't have to keep a really tight arc and it is a great turd chaser. So Now on other parts of the loot uh, where the uh, the top of the volute going into the discharge. I put in that, that part of it right there on this corner right here. It likes to, to, to really abrade through in no time flat. So what I did is I put a piece of solid steel rod right there to act as the divider and um, the uh, the weld going from the, uh, you know, that w w where it blends into the volute. Now I covered that with stainless steel, with stainless steel rod. And the reason being for that is the stainless will resist the abrasion of the material going through the volute a whole lot better than an, a regular kind of rod will. And then the same thing on the discharge, there was a little step in there right here. Well, YouTubers, that's a wrap for this uh, episode of Building the Blower. Um, today's 
portion of it is just the you know the the sheet metal work the welding and all that the next episode is going to be balancing the uh, the impeller and you know polishing up the shaft a few other little tricks there uh, I was having some difficulty in the dif disassembly and so uh, what I wound up doing is, is uh, you know resorting to some old tricks in order to uh, be able to tear this down so definitely come back for that and uh, you know maybe you'll pick up a few tricks there uh, you know that you can use in your own shop so anyway with that thanks for stopping by thanks for all the new subscribers that have came on board and uh, if you have any thoughts comments critiques suggestions or ideas <clears throat> by all means put them in the comment section below it's always good to get a little traffic um, I apologize if there's not been a video in a while it's just this project has really ate up a lot of time and I'm not getting out much mainly because of it so anyway there's going to be more content later on down the road so anyway stop by for the next portion of this uh, this series and uh, we'll hope to see you again all soon